I'm Chris Field. I'm the director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. A pleasure to have you here. Before I introduce our, our guest for today, Michael Mann, I want to highlight that in January we'll have two environmental conversations. Carter Roberts on January 15th. He's the president of WWF uh, US. And at the end of the month, we'll have Sally Jewell, the former Secretary of the Interior. So watch out for both of those. I think it should be fabulous. But not as fabulous as today's. Uh, we're exceedingly fortunate to have Mike Mann, who's really uh, plays a unique role in the, in the climate science community. He's a distinguished climate scientist, and he's really the first person to figure out how to develop a statistically robust record of uh, past Earth temperatures over the last 1,000 years. But he's had a, a really distinguished career that has built on that science foundation to take him in a wide range of different directions that have included uh, work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, being a, a highly visible and, uh, as, as you'll hear about, a, a highly, um, well, let's say, attractive to a wide range of interests to attack uh, entity in the, in the uh, public science arena. And, and I think that more than anything else, Mike has really capitalized on uh, the, the recognition in order to advance the agenda for understanding the way the climate system works and, and what we need to do about it. And he's really emerged as one of the most eloquent and effective voices on, on ways to deal with the climate challenge. Mike has really been an um, individual who has found ways to explain the climate issue, to explain the way that our understanding of it has been uh, distorted by interests whose uh, you know, paycheck dependent on distorting it. And he's also been incredibly courageous about defending his position, defending the scientific community, and, and um, helping the general public understand paths forward. Uh, Mike's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. He's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Been recognized with a number of important awards. And what impresses me the most about him is that he has just consistently stuck with the agenda of making climate science clear, uh, explaining the importance, and engaging the broad public in what's been a personal passion of his. So it's wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you, Chris. It's a real honor to thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's an honor uh, to do this event with you. Um, and I'm honored that the, uh, the Woods Institute is supporting this uh, effort. I, I do have to say I was a little apprehensive uh, in doing an event at Stanford on Big Game Weekend. The cow bear is a loyal cow bear. Um, so go bears. <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually OK with it. I bought a, I bought a tree, though. I bought, I bought the stuffed uh, tree at the Stanford bookstore. Everywhere I go, I, uh, every university or college I go to, I make sure to buy my daughter uh, a stuffed mascot. And, and this was a difficult decision, but uh, it, to be consistent, I, I, we've got a tree. We've got an Oski the bear at home as well. So um, let me, I, I have a kind of a, a arc that I would love to see this conversation go on. And, and I want to start with a little conversation about the science behind coming up with a statistically robust temperature record. People had been wondering for a long time if it was warmer now than it used to be. And you're really the person who figured that out. Well, you know, it's uh, the way science works. It's often this sort of um, erratic path, a, a random walk is the term we use in physics to describe, you know, you know journeys which have a stochastic or random component to them. You don't know where you're going to end up. And in my case, uh, I ended up uh, studying uh, applied math and physics at UC Berkeley, went off to Yale University to, to study theoretical physics, and then realized that there was this emerging fascinating field, uh, climate science, where you could use math and, and physics um, to work on this fascinating problem of understanding how Earth's climate works. Uh, in the process of doing that, I became very interested in, in long-term natural climate cycles. And the reason we turned to so-called proxy records, tree rings, corals, ice cores, uh, lake sediments, uh, uh, natural archives that can tell us about how climate changed in the more distant past, was that the instrumental record, which only gives us you know, a, a century or so of widespread uh, information, isn't long enough to isolate long-term natural cycles. And so in my case, uh, 
the, the for our forays into reconstructing past climate uh, was driven by an interest in natural climate variability and internal uh, climate cycles, like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, but which have a longer time scale to them. Um, and that makes it important to understand how much of that natural variability is superimposed on a potential long-term trend caused by human activity. Our focus was on the natural variability. What drove us uh, to make these forays into reconstructing past climates with proxy data was an interest in natural climate variability. But when we assembled those data and we formed this reconstruction of past temperatures, and we did the scientifically least interesting thing you could do, because what we really wanted to know were what were the, the large scale patterns? Where was it warm? Where was it cold in any particular year? What was the pattern of response of the climate system to the 1815 Tambora eruption known as the year without a summer, at least in Europe? Uh, what was the pattern of past El Nino events? Um, that was what we were interested in. The least thing, interesting thing you can do with those rich spatial patterns is to average over them to get a single number for each year the average temperature, in this case, of the northern hemisphere. And when we plotted that out, we realized that, hmm, um, this study maybe does have some implications for human-caused climate change. Because what we found was that the recent warming spike of the past century has no counterpart as far back as we could go a, a thousand years. Now, there had been some previous efforts to form reconstructions of this sort. Uh, but we used sort of a novel statistical approach that, among other things, allowed us to produce error bars. Um, and it was published in 1998, which was the warmest year on record for the instrumental data that we have. And what we were able to conclude was that not only was 1998 the warmest year on record uh, for the past century, it was probably uh, one of the few, if not the warmest years as far back as we could go, a thousand years. And the warming trend that we've seen has no precedent as far back as we could go. And so it was, you know, I suddenly found myself as, you know, a Berkeley you know, physics and applied math major um, in the very center of the most contentious political debate that we've possibly ever had as a society, the debate over human-caused climate change and what to do about it. And as Chris has alluded to it, though it isn't the, the path that I charted out, it wasn't what I saw uh, you know, myself doing uh, for, uh, you know, I envisioned a career where I would be in, a, in an office at my computer solving problems, crunching numbers. That's what I love doing. Uh, but when the hockey stick became this icon in the climate change debate, that was no longer uh, an option. Um, whether I liked it or not, I was now this, the hockey stick was this icon in the climate change debate. And as the principal author, I became this public figure. Um, and I had to decide what I was going to do with that. Um, and ultimately, I de decided to embrace that um, and use that as an opportunity to inform this conversation <laughs> over what is potentially the, the greatest challenge we face as a civilization. I have no regrets. I can't imagine doing anything, you know, devoting my life to anything more important than that. But it's not what I set out to do by any stretch of the imagination. Let me um, just mention the ground rules of the way we'll run today's conversation. Mike and I will exchange ideas for the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to a general conversation with all of you. And we will play that out. Well, at least until the to the end of the hour, but uh, we can go on as as long as uh, you have questions and Mike is patient. It, I, I want to follow up on the the what happened when the hockey stick paper was published. Did did you realize right away that this put you in the center of the massive political debate about the essence of climate change? Uh, it, no, not until uh, the the day that uh, the Nature article came out. It was April 22nd, 1998. That was Earth Day of the warmest year on record. Uh, and it, the hockey stick had its 20th anniversary earlier this year on Earth Day this year. It, it's now been Happy two birthday. decades. <laughs> Thank you. It's doing just fine. Uh, um, in fact, uh, if anything, it has uh, grown. <laughs> At least the it's blade. It's like stick now at this point, right? That, that's right. Unfortunately, um, that's 20 years during which we haven't made nearly as much progress as we should have made in tackling this problem. And it's, a, it's sort of a sober reminder of that. But um, the, uh, the, the, the day it was published, um, I, I was sort of um, I was surprised by the intensity of the media interest. Uh, I didn't sort of foresee that uh, all of the major uh, television news networks, and this was sort of 
before the time when cable news dominated the uh, television wor uh, news world, the, the, the network news programs really were the, the principal, I think, um, uh, programs from which people got their um, you know, television uh, news. And uh, it was featured in all, the, um, all three uh, network, uh, television, ABC, NBC, um, and CBS news programs. Uh, Dan Rather introduced the story. Uh, the correspondent I spoke to is John Roberts. He's now at Fox News. He's the only person at Fox News I've ever done an interview with. <laughs> because I realize I can get a fair interview with John Roberts, with whom I've established this relationship, deep in enemy territory. <laughs> um, and I did actually do an interview with him uh, when the last IPCC report uh, came out. Um, and it was a fair interview. Uh, those relationships are important to to, uh, to cultivate. Uh, but no, I had no idea. It and it, of course, it was on CNN, it, uh, front page uh, of uh, many of our national newspapers, um, led the Science Times section of the New York Times that week, the Tuesday Science section. And at that point, when I saw how much attention it was getting, and of course, I was familiar with uh, the circumstances, um, the sort of uh, some of the uh, the episodes that our good friend Ben Santer of uh, uh, was that uh, uh, Lord Livermore, Lord Livermore, Livermore uh, um, a leading climate scientist uh, who played an instrumental role in the second assessment report in the 1995 report. In fact, his work. Uh, was, I would argue, um, fundamental to the key conclusion that was reached in the summary for policymakers of that report, that there is now a discernible human influence on the climate. Well, that, that was fighting, those were fighting words to Saudi Arabia and some other powerful fossil fuel uh, uh, countries and, and companies. Um, and Ben found himself vilified um, on the editor editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. There was a campaign. Uh, deployed against him to discredit him as a scientist, uh, to discredit him as a person, uh, because of the fundamentally inconvenient nature of his findings. And I remember talking with Ben uh, before the, that IPCC report um, came out, uh, uh, I think it was the previous summer, and talking to him about his experiences. I figured it would be interesting you know, to, to, to get some um, insights from him, were I ever to be subject to something like that myself. And of course, as fate had it, uh, I would indeed later that year be subject to precisely the same sorts of efforts that uh, Ben had withstood, uh, efforts to discredit me, um, to discredit my science, to discredit this now iconic uh, curve, the hockey stick curve, which, and it was a threat to those powerful vested interests primarily because you didn't need to understand the complexities of Earth's climate system, the physics of how a climate model works, um, the, the radiative properties of greenhouse gases to understand what this curve was telling us, that there's something unprecedented taking place today in our climate and by implication probably has to do with us. And how long was it between the time the paper was published and the attack started? Um, I, if you could. <laughs> Count it off um, on the second hand of your watch. Uh, it, it was not long at all uh, when some of the usual suspects, um, uh, there were, at the time there was this uh, online journal, uh, the World Climate Report, um, uh, WCRP. Uh, I think they were missing the A <laughs> between the CR and the P. Um, uh, and this was, in fact, a, a pseudo-journal, something we've come to be very familiar with now, um, that was uh, run by uh, Pat Michaels, um, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, but also a very uh, prominent recipient of fossil fuel money and one of the leading climate change contrarians slash climate change deniers, um, basically a, a hired hand of fossil fuel interests whose job it was to try to discredit uh, the science of climate change. And it wasn't soon after, all that uh, long after, rather, uh, the publication of our, our article that it was being attacked, for example, um, in, in the pages of this uh, this, this uh, journal, um, and uh, letters to the editor, uh, editorials, um, you know, uh, Wall Street Journal might have taken a year or two for me to be vilified um, on the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, 
And that ramped up over time. Uh, I would say the critical development uh, wasn't so much the publication in 1998 of the original hockey stick or a year later in 99, the extension back a thousand years, which is the more familiar hockey stick curve that people see these days. Um, it was probably when it was featured in the summary for policymakers of the 2001 IPCC report. Remember, Ben was vilified because of the importance of his work to the second assessment report. Summary for policymakers, this is something that uh, you know, politicians, um, journalists, people around the world um, read, and, 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 and it has a fundamentally important uh, impact on the discourse over climate change. So when our work and when the hockey stick curve was sort of um, exhibit A <laughs> in, um, in the summary for policymakers of the 2001 uh, third assessment report, which I had worked on, it was now sort of the poster child of climate change. And that made it an irresistible object of attack by the sort of disinformation, the climate change denial machine. And that's really when things ramped up. In the following years, I would be uh, asked to testify at hostile um, Senate hearings and House of Representative, uh, a, a, a hearing of the House of Representatives. I was um, uh, subject to uh, a threat of a congressional subpoena uh, by Joe Barton of Texas, uh, who had to resign earlier this year. Um, he, uh, well, he was texting images of himself to an individual, and don't Google it. Don't Google. Don't don't Google this. Once you see these images, you cannot unsee them. <laughs> Do not do it. I, I, I warned you. I warned you. Um, so Joe Barton uh, ultimately stepped down from Congress, but he uh, tried to subpoena all of my emails uh, from uh, the University of Virginia. Um, and uh, when he was unsuccessful a few years later, Ken Cuccinelli, the Attorney General of Virginia, tried to get at the same uh, emails and, and so on. Ultimately, then there was, of course, in 2009, the stolen uh, emails from the University of East Anglia and the manufactured controversy of climate gate, which was used to sort of derail um, the, uh, the, the um, uh, that was in Paris, the, not Paris, that was um, uh, going to Copenhagen, the Copenhagen summit, summit of uh, uh, <clears throat> December 2009. Um, and it remains, you know, despite the fact that there are now dozens of studies uh, that have come to the same conclusion and extended that conclusion farther back in time because the hockey stick is still this icon. It's still attacked as if, you know, if they could bring down the hockey stick, well, they'd have to bring down dozens of other hockey sticks now. Um, but it's this idea, it's this cynical principle that if you can take an icon and you can discredit it, then you can claim to have undermined uh, the entire case for concern about climate change, as if it hinged on one 20-year-old study well, by one postdoc. You know, I think that's right. That's the house of cards philosophy, right? That if, you, if there is a, um, a key card and you pull it out, the whole thing falls down, when, of course, the essence of our understanding of climate change is that there are a huge number of lines of independent evidence. It's a brick wall with, with a few the other, bricks right? missing, but that's what yeah. it is at this point, yeah. I wonder if you want to say a little bit about the, um, the the experience that both Ben and you had, and our colleague Steve Schneider, where Absolutely. the um, the approach that the climate denial machine took was to identify one person, often a person very early in their scientific career, and try and um, make them personally the focus rather than the kind of enterprise of science. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually coined a term for this phenomenon. I call it the Serengeti strategy. Um, and it was motivated by the fact that um, uh, I was um, at an IPCC meeting in Arusha, Tanzania, uh, back in 90, uh, 99, I believe it was. Um, and when we were starting to finalize the chapter that I was a co-author on climate observations for the next IPCC report, the third assessment report. And we had this excursion one day um, where we went off to the, the Serengeti um, to see all the amazing wildlife um, that, uh, that, that is to be seen. And, uh, and one of the interesting things that uh, somebody you know, commented on the fact that uh, the zebras uh, tend to stand back to back and they form a wall of stripes. Um, and and w why do they do that? Well, because they, they, you can't pick off an individual if it's just a wall. Um, and it's the few stray individuals who leave the, the protection of the wall of stripes who become vulnerable to an attack by a, a lion. Uh, and it seemed to me like an appropriate uh, sort of metaphor for what 
we had been we had experienced, where the critics are looking for that vulnerable, isolated scientist um, to and to attack them. And, and did you feel like you had the wall of stripes to help protect you? How, what, how do you think the rest of the scientific community stepped up to the risk that yeah. this represented? I think Ben and, and Steve and, and and myself and we were we were we were at the edges of that wall um, and, and and that made us a little more vulnerable than than everyone else and the attempt was to dislodge us from the wall entirely and, and take us down like a like a zebra or a gazelle um, uh, and fortunately you know science in science uh, even in this uh, era of uh, alternative facts and, and fake news um, in science, there are facts that are objectively true, and if you're wrong, you know, then subsequent research will establish you're wrong. And if you're right, then subsequent research, independent assessments by other scientists, will reaffirm your findings or hopefully improve upon them and extend them. And uh, ultimately, you know, the the hockey stick has stood the test of time. But sort of coming back, I guess, to the the question. Um, you know, I, uh, Steve Schneider, of course, a close friend of many of ours here, and it was uh, very sad to, to lose him some years ago. Uh, he was a mentor to me uh, when I was uh, subject to that subpoena from Joe Barton. A little intimidating. I'm an uh, assistant professor at the University of Virginia, untenured professor. Um, I get a fax, a fax from, you know, the office of uh, the head of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the U.S. Uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, demanding all of uh, my, you know, papers and, 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 and uh, uh, subjecting me to sort of an inquisition, a whole set of questions, um, demanding that I provide responses to them and materials to them. Uh, it was very intimidating for a young scientist who had never been through anything like that. Uh, I sort of ha had a sense that these things can happen because of you know the experiences Steve had gone through and, and Ben Santer in particular. The first thing that I did was to call Steve Schneider. Um, and within 24 hours, I had pro bono uh, representation by one of the best lawyers in Washington, DC, who had actually worked uh, defending scientists during the tobacco wars. Um, and, uh, and that was uh, David Vladek, uh, was the name of uh, a Georgetown University uh, law professor. And that was Steve's doing. Um, and that's critical, that those first 24 hours are when you could make the biggest mistakes, depending on how you react to that pressure. Uh, and this is something, you know, Steve isn't around uh, today um, to help other scientists, but those of us who have been through this and have learned from Steve's tutelage and, and others, I like to think that I'm now in the role where I can help out uh, other younger scientists who find themselves subject to precisely the same sort of um, attacks that I was subject to. In fact, we helped establish the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, which now is a thriving organization that helps young scientists who do find themselves subject to Freedom of Information Act requests and other um, forms of uh, legal and political intimidation. I, I wonder if we could um, talk about two components of the way that you responded to these attacks, one by um, being an outspoken and effective science communicator, and I think your your books speak to the effectiveness of that. But then uh, you've also chosen legal channels to push back, and I think that those, um, they, they equally importantly balance each other, and I think either one couldn't be successful without the other in some sense. Well, thanks. I, I'm very much an adherent uh, as, as a loyal Cal Bears fan. Uh, <laughs> But I hate to say it, it's true, Stanford as well. Uh, good, uh, the best uh, defense is a good offense. It's true in college football, um, and I think it's true in uh, the defense of science. Uh, the best way that, in, in part, um, if you cannot become an, uh, an effective spokesperson for the science, for your science, but for the science more broadly, um, then you're unable to get your message out. Um, uh, you, the only way you get access uh, to prominent media is by being able to you know, make a cogent uh, and uh, uh, a cogent and uh, you know, convincing uh, case um, in terms that are understandable to the common person that aren't laden in technical jargon. Uh, Steve, that's what made Steve so effective was his ability 
to communicate science uh, to people without uh, technical backgrounds in basic terms using appropriate metaphors and analogies. Um, and the more effective you are um, as a spokesperson, uh, the more able you are to get your message out. And the more able you're able to get your message out, the less effective those who are trying to undermine uh, you and, and your messaging uh, are likely to be. Um, now on the legal front, uh, I won't say a whole lot about it because there are still pending <laughs> matters. Um, I have to be very careful what I say other than, you know, it's one thing to disagree uh, with a scientist. Um, uh, but when you accuse a scientist of fraud, um, that's libelous, especially when there have been a dozen investig investigations to precisely um, those charges, all of which have vindicated <laughs> all of which have vindicated the scientist um, and the uh, accuser uh, would know or should have known the, the, to be the case, um, then that's, that's actually libel. Um, and we're, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to uh, accuse uh, and uh, you know, a, a falsely accuse a scientist of, uh, of fraud. Uh, and if you do, then you should expect to be subject to um, potential uh, legal repercussions, we'll say. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I would love to know more about that, but I, but I respect the ongoing nature <laughs> of the, maybe we'll, we'll turn to the children's book Ooh. and tell me about why you wrote a children's book and, and what it says. Yeah, so it's the, the tantrum that saved the world. Um, and it came out uh, a little less than a year ago. Um, it's aimed at uh, five to 10 year olds um, and current occupants of the White House. Um, <laughs> it's at about the right, the right reading level, um, really pitched, I think, right about the, um, and, but, but really, you know, as somebody uh, like you, Chris, um, you know, those of us who are passionate at communicating um, the science um, and its implications to the public are always looking for new ways of doing that um, and new audiences to speak to um, and, and, and thinking outside the box, um, you know, sometimes the narratives become a little stale um, and if you just repeat the same old message, people become inured to that message. So we have to constantly think of inventive ways of, uh, of connecting the dots, helping people connect the dots. This isn't just a far off uh, problem in the future. This is something we're dealing with now. Um, so, you know, that's why I've, um, you know, joined forces with a cartoonist, in the case of Tom Tolles, in The Madhouse Effect, um, which is uh, now uh, out of stock at Amazon, uh, at, thanks to uh, Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman uh, in paperback. You can still get the Kindle <laughs> and, and the hardbacks. Uh, so um, that was, and to me, the opportunity there uh, has to do with the fact that in today's hyper-partisan atmosphere, where people have become so balkanized um, and tribal in the way they think about matters of objective truth, like the existence of climate change, uh, or as uh, John Oliver uh, would point out, or the existence of hats or <laughs> owls. <laughs> um, apparently, we can't agree on, on the basic facts anymore. And that, again, requires us, I think, to look for inventive ways to maybe reach people who, whose front door is closed. You're not going to barge through the front door with facts and figures and graphs. That, that's closed. So you look for the side door. And humor and satire is one of those side doors. It's one of those ways of reaching people um, through alternative avenues uh, that um, maybe are still accessible. And uh, I think it's part of why, again, in today's hyper-partisan sort of political atmosphere, um, our hardest hitting commentary often comes from our comedians. The hardest hitting commentary in the Washington Post is Tom Toll's cartoons. There's no question about it. The hardest hitting commentary on television is John Oliver and Samantha Bee and uh, Saturday Night Live uh, plays that role as well. Colbert, of course. Uh, how did I forget <laughs> Stephen Colbert? I'm embarrassed. Um, so that, now the children's book is something different. Uh, and, and it has to, this is another, people say, well, you know, five to 10 year olds, they're not in a position to do anything uh, about the world. And, and that's completely wrong. They're in an amazing position to do something about the, the world. When you read a book to your child, there is an experience, there's this intergenerational experience that's taking place. And, and there is um, education in both directions, um, affective uh, education, um, parents responding emotionally to, to their children in the way that they respond 
say to a book. And I still remember the first time I read the Lorax to my uh, daughter when she was, I don't know, maybe five or six years old and, and was tearful. She was tearful at, at the end of that book. Um, and I tried to explain to her that actually it's an optimistic <laughs> book. There's, there's, there, there's a little window of optimism at the end. Um, and it's always very challenging, um, right, to, to, to convey the urgency without conveying uh, uh, an atmosphere of despair and despondency and, and, and defeatism. And uh, I think that the Lorax manages to pull that off. Um, there's a Seussian quality um, to this book. It's purely in terms of the pentameter of the, of the text, uh, uh, which was primarily written by my co-author, Meg Herbert, who's a professional uh, children's book writer and uh, book author and uh, illustrator. Um, but uh, it's empowering. So uh, we try to convey the, the reality and the threat of climate change and, and, and sort of the conceit that we use is that these animals start appearing at this girl's door. These are animals that have been displaced by climate change. And it starts out with a polar bear, but it's a swarm of bees and sea turtles. And, 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 and it's not just about the polar bear, because too often it's just the polar bear. No, it's about uh, the entire animal kingdom um, and the species that are being impacted, uh, a Bengal tiger, um, a, uh, uh, a, um, and, uh, and she becomes increasingly frustrated that this is initially by the fact that these animals are showing up at, the, at her door, but, uh, but more frustrated by the fact that the adults in her world aren't doing something about this. And she becomes empowered to do something um, about it herself. Um, and and, it, and it, it takes you on that journey of watching her sort of um, recognize, and I think this is important for the youth of today, to recognize that um, you have to fight for your own future. Um, and there's the potential for children to raise awareness, bring awareness to the adults in their lives who are in a position uh, to, to make a direct impact on our, on our pol politics and policy. I think we've seen that today I th uh, with uh, issues that we never thought we could um, really tackle, like um, you know, common sense gun laws. Uh, and what we've seen is sort of the voice of our youth emerge in a way that's very powerful. Um, and uh, and, 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 and uh, it's, uh, I think it's actually spread. It started out um, in that shooting in, in Florida, uh, Parkland uh, High School, but I think it's grown now as a movement where you now see youth uh, movements um, surrounding the issue of climate change. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was very effective um, was uh, with the, um, with the, 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 the effort by these Parkland students um, to uh, force, you know, Again, uh, gun legis uh, you know, uh, try to force a change in our gun laws um, was this idea of um, you know, children uh, signing a contract with their parents that says that they will not vote uh, for a politician who supports, in this case, the NRA. Um, and, and I think that that sort of points to a possible path forward where this energy and intensity that I haven't seen in our youth since my days at UC Berkeley in the late 80s, um, the apartheid movement, um, which took place on the, which started on the UC campus, spread nationwide, and ultimately pressured the South African government into abandoning the uh, policy of apartheid. That was due to college students. And I'm, sure, and I'm sure you must have the same kinds of student intensity at Penn State. We certainly do here. I, I hope they're. I think I've seen that. in the audience. Yeah, no, student, high school students, college students. Um, I, 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 I see, I perceive a sea change now in, you know, there was this cynicism that, um, you know, caused them to sit out of elections and, and disengage. Um, and now there's a recognition that the only way we're going to solve these problems is if they do engage in the political process. And I think we're seeing a shift. Let me, let me ask one last question before I turn it over to all of you. All of you can start thinking about what your question is going to be. And I wonder if you could just kind of encapsulate where you think we are in either or both the understanding of the climate challenge and in actually being able to deploy meaningful solutions at scale. 
So I, I now think that part of the reason that you see politicians who used to deny that climate change is real um, are evolving. And, and Tom Tolles and I you know, have, have a chapter about the stages of denial, from it's not happening to it's happening, but it's not due to human activity, to, and on and on until the, the final stage of denial is, yeah, it's happening, it's caused by human activity, it's bad, but there's nothing we can do about it anyway, uh, which is just as wrong as any of those other um, sort of uh, uh, arguments. Um, I think we've reached the point where the impacts of climate change have become so obvious to the person on the street that no politician can try to seriously deny that something is happening. And so instead you see this evolution in the narrative um, and again realize that the only bottom line that uh, polluting interests care about is inaction. The reason for that inaction doesn't matter. Um, so the evolution now is away from outright denial of the science to denial of the impacts that climate change is having. Um, and you know that's why we have a president um, who appointed uh, fossil fuel lobbyists. He appointed the CEO of Exxon Mobil <laughs> to be in charge of uh, internet, uh, you know, uh, Department the State, Department yeah. of State, uh, Secretary <laughs> of State uh, uh, Rex Tillerson. Um, this is uh, an administration that has been outsourced to uh, the Koch brothers and polluting interests. It's nominally you know, Donald Trump, but it's really uh, fossil fuel interests and uh, dark money um, uh, outfits, the Koch brothers. Uh, and that's why you have a president who argues that uh, the California wildfires, the unprecedented wildfires we've seen in this state, are due to a lack of raking. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up, right? <laughs> You can't make this stuff up. Um, and, and we laugh at it because it's ridiculous, but it's pernicious too. Because he, it's, it's not accidental. Um, he is communicating to their base that this is not a climate change impact. That these, and, and same thing with the superstorms and floods uh, that we have witnessed in recent years. So the game now for these people is to deny that this is a problem and to make a cynical argument that the best way forward, that it will destroy the economy if we do something about this problem, when in fact the opposite is true. The cost of inaction is already way larger than the cost of action, and we've seen that play out vividly over the last uh, several years in terms of all of these natural disasters and superstorms uh, that, like uh, Maria and, and Michael, uh, the one that bears my name, uh, the most intense landfalling storm um, in, uh, to strike uh, the, the East Florida. Coast, uh, Florida, um, at this late in the season. So the game now is to deny that it's a problem and to argue that if we do something about it, it will destroy the economy, when just the opposite is true. Inaction is the greatest threat to the economy. And by the way, the real growth industry is renewable energy. And the countries that recognize that are the ones who are going to win out in this international economic competition over the next century. Um, so that's what they're, and they're trying to buy time. Right, because they've got these assets, as we know, that become stranded assets. They've got a lot of fossil fuels left to sell. And the name of the game is to try to extend the denial and inaction for as long as possible so they can continue to make these trillions of record, uh, you know, trillion dollar, tr trillions of dollar profits every year. Okay, well, thanks very much. Let, uh, let's turn it over to your questions now. And uh, what I need to have happen is you raise your hand, we'll call on you and get you a microphone so that our recording captures the eloquence of what your question <laughs> addresses. So, um, Roberta, do you just want to decide? <laughs> <laughs> and if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, that would help us as well. I think that was a biased pass to the microphone. Thank you, Roberta. Um, I love the fact that you've got you know, a new op-ed or interview out about every other day. And just kind of building on the themes you've been running with, I'd love to hear more about how you approach the strategy, in particular in an age where we're working with increasingly fractured media and maybe a surge of polarization on the issue. What would it mean to kind of heal and inspire America on this issue in the current moment? Hey, what was that last part? What to... Uh... Yeah. Uh, heal and inspire America on the climate issue in our current uh, moment. So like what strategies I would invoke to try to do that? Yeah, uh, just yeah. kind of, uh, yeah. it feels like we can talk to people who agree that climate change is an issue, but that isn't getting us all that far. 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that we have to, you know, maintain as many tools in our arsenal as we can. And that's why I've, uh, the four books that I've written are all very different, uh, reaching out to different audiences, using different approaches when it comes to media. I'm, I'm always enthusiastic about doing uh, television uh, media um, and talking to as many journalists and responding. Part of it is to is to try to respond to every journalist who contacts you. Um, because sometimes all you need, you know, it, it can take a minute. You just give them a, a, a response um, and they can use that. And, and you're getting your message out. And I find that uh, journalists really appreciate that. And then you cultivate a relationship with them. Uh, and that's true uh, with, with television and, and radio as well. So I think part of it is cultivating these relationships so you have access and, and, and that access uh, allows you to get your message out um, because you know you will have an opportunity when the national climate assessment uh, comes out. You'll have an opportunity to help get your message out and, and give your version uh, of um, uh, what you think is the important story. And sometimes that'll be complementary to what the authors of the report are saying or what other scientists are saying. Um, so really, now in terms of whom we're trying to reach, um, and when you do an interview on CNN or you know, MSNBC or uh, the news, news hour is more of a niche, uh, you know, a more sophisticated audience. But uh, often you are speaking to such a broadband audience that you sort of have to default to the lowest common denominator. You have to speak in pretty simple terms. If you're on the evening news, you have to remember that uh, communication experts were telling you you're, you're speaking to sort of a sixth grade uh, reading and comprehension level. That's what you're aiming for. Donald Trump understands that. Make no mistake about it. He understands that perfectly, and his message is tailored uh, to that. Um, so you're re trying to reach a broad audience. Um, you're not going to convince the dismissives, the really hardcore, and the polling suggests maybe it's 15% of our population, the, the, the ones who really spend their time commenting in news threads and, and re really proactive in their denial of climate change. Um, you're not going to reach them, you're not going to convince them, uh, and, and my efforts are not aimed at them. But they are aimed at those who are caught in the crossfire, uh, the, what I call the confused middle, who hear the arguments of the delayers and deniers, um, and they, uh, they think that there's a, a real debate. Um, they're convinced by that, that there is a debate about the, the basics, about the reality of climate change. So I would say I'm largely target at, targeted at the, 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 the sort of confused middle, um, helping them understand that there is a very deep consensus, as deep a consensus as there is in gravity, uh, I like to point out. Um, there's still uncertainty. I mean, what is it? 90% of the mass in the universe, we don't know where it comes from, okay? That's a pretty big uncertainty um, in gravity, uh, but it doesn't make it safe to jump off a cliff. And yet there are those who would argue that we should jump off the metaphorical cliff of climate inaction. So um, bringing them to understand that, the, that there is a very strong consensus, um, there isn't a debate, um, that's important because that helps bring them along. And, and it turns out there's, um, there's you know, very careful sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, social science uh, studies um, that, uh, that demonstrate that that's sort of a gateway sort of uh, belief that if you, as, if you simply recognize that there is a, a strong consensus, that is a gateway to becoming far more engaged on this issue. Um, but you also have the next cat. So you got the confused middle. We're ignoring the dismissives. I'm not going to move them. Maybe, you know, Bob Inglis, conservative congressman from South Carolina, um, who talks about free uh, markets and how we can solve this problem. And, or jo George Schultz, uh, who I know is here at the in Hoover Institute and, and speaks to sort of some of those same constituencies, a conservative who argues for market, you know, approaches like Reagan did, <laughs> like Bush, both Bushes did. Um, um, like Nixon really did, uh, founded the EPA. Uh, so to uh, uh, digression, I realize I'm getting a little uh, off on a tangent here, but um, I'm not going to convince the dismissives. You know, ivory tower academic, probably they're not going to listen to me. But somebody from their own tribe, you know, uh, somebody from the national security community, or a Reagan, you know, Republican, or um, you know, uh, uh, evangelical Christian um, who speaks to that constituency. Um, I'm focused on that confused middle, making sure they understand that 
This, there's a disinformation campaign that's intended to pull the wool over your eyes. They're trying to deceive you. They're trying to trick you. They're laughing at you. Um, and they, they think that you will fall for this nonsense. Understand that there is an overwhelming scientific consensus. And then you have the category, the sort of concerned, and the, um, and the highest is the, uh, someone help me out here, in the six Americas. The alarmed, thank you, the, the concerned and the alarmed. Um, the concerned, uh, thanks John Mashey. <laughs> um, the, the concerned uh, sometimes uh, don't understand the urgency. Um, they know it's a problem, but they're not aware of just how profound the impacts of climate change are already and just how quickly we need to ramp down our emissions if we're going to avert catastrophic impacts on our climate. So bringing them to understand that uh, there is a great urgency um, to action now. And then ultimately, with the, um, the alarmed, there is this interesting feature that you sometimes see in, in the world of politics where the two ends of the political spectrum meet. <laughs> um, and, and that occurs to some extent here with the, when you look at the position, or at least the, the path the, 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 the argued for by the dismissives and some of the alarmed, um, where there is this narrative that has become increasingly commonplace among some in the, that alarmed category. Um, and they look to people like uh, uh, Guy McPherson, who's a, a scientist who claims that uh, we will all be extinct in 10 years, no matter what we do, because of exponential climate change, whatever he means by that. Um, <clears throat> and there's no reason to do anything. Well, and we had an op-ed in the Washington Post about a year ago uh, about that, about um, how that can be every bit as dangerous as outright denial because it leads us down the same path of, of inaction. And to some extent, I think that there, some of those folks have been compromised, where that message is actually being um, amplified by the forces of denial. In, in sort of in the same way, some, the same trick that we saw play out in our last presidential election, um, actually co-opting the alarmed and turning and weaponizing them um, as a tool for inaction, for the agenda of the denialists. And, and I think that that's happening to some extent. And so with those folks, it's very important for them to understand. And we all understand that this is the case. There is still time. We can still take the actions necessary to avert catastrophic warming. Uh, there was a special report of the IPCC um, just uh, you know, a, a little over a month ago um, that uh, demonstrated the path. And, 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 and that it's a pretty steep path. If we had acted 20 years ago, um, you know, when the hockey stick first appeared, uh, we would have, uh, you know, our emissions curve, we've got to ramp down our emissions, and it would have been a bunny slope. And I can do a bunny slope. Um, uh, but I can't do the black double diamond. Um, that's what we have to do now, and that's what 20 years of inaction has, has brought us. Um, and so I guess the point is great urgency for the you know, confused middle, uh, or it, 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 consensus for the confused middle, urgency for the concerned, and agency for the alarmed. Great. Thank you. Uh, Microphone passers coming up again. again uh, I think you can just pick. <laughs> There's the um, hockey stick. Um, uh, my name is Peter Dreckmeyer. I live in Palo Alto. Um, there's the also the hockey stick for population growth. And there was a lot of talk about that here at Stanford back in the late 60s and 70s with the Ehrlichs, but we don't hear much conversation. It seems like that's a pretty critical issue. Is that something that you're seeing any movement on? Yeah, no, uh, Paul is a, is a good friend of mine. I, I, I was hoping I might see him on this. Uh, I, I want to point out there's Anne right there. Uh, oh, we're, we're, uh, oh, I, I, um, so, uh, you know, I think, um, and I've talked about this in my various books, um, you know, Paul, along with Rachel Carson and, and our friend Steve Schneider, to some extent, have been boogeymen, uh, or boogie people, I guess, it, of sort of the forces of uh, anti-science, um, or as, uh, as um, Paul and Anne coined, the, the brown lash, uh, uh, the, the backlash uh, against um, sort of environmental action. Uh, the, and it's because who do they attack? They attack messages and messengers that are effective. Um, 
you know, why were they going after Nancy Pelosi? Sorry. <laughs> because she's so effective. Um, they, they, and, and, and if it wasn't her, it's going to be whoever replaces her if they're effective. And we have to start recognizing that that's, that's the game being played. Um, and, and that's the game here, is to try to vilify um, uh, scientists who have played an instrumental role um, and to make them toxic to their fellow scientists and to drive a wedge into the scientific community that can then be used for their agenda of manufacturing of doubt and confusion. Um, and that was certainly the case with Paul. Uh, there were two books that, um, that, that, uh, that sat on our bookcase um, that I remember very well when I was growing up um, that were about the environment. My parents weren't scientists. They weren't uh, environmental activists. And so that meant that these were iconic books. They were part of our family book collection. Um, it was Silent Spring. And it was the population bomb. And, uh, and I know that it's become a popular tactic. Uh, in fact, uh, just the other day on one of the networks, I think it was CNN, uh, Tom DeLay, because of course he's so authoritative, uh, <laughs> um, Tom DeLay uh, trotted out the uh, myth of, you know, um, you know, that, uh, you know, Paul's work uh, and population and that it had been discredited. And in fact, there have been massive scientific reviews. Uh, and the finding is that you know, maybe the time scale of that exponential curve might be different from what we estimated it to be decades ago. Um, but we're still on this exponential curve of resource depletion uh, in sustainability. And the, the basic thesis of, you know, Ann and Paul has very much stood the test of time. And we have to defend that because what they try to do, they want to knock these things down. And, and too often we're willing to allow them to do that um, in an effort to, oh, I don't know, maybe we, we will you know, create some goodwill by, and, and that's not how it works. Um, it's like Lucy and the football, right? And we, we fall for it every time. We have to stop doing that. We have to defend um, these you know, leaders in the scientific community, uh, Rachel Carson, in some respects, it's even worse because there's sort of this, um, this element of misogyny that uh, underlies many of the attacks that we've seen leveled uh, against her over the years. And, and she was fundamentally right. Um, uh, so, but I didn't even come close to answering your question, which is the role of population. Um, so there's the uh, famous Kaya identity that uh, Bill Gates uh, discovered two years ago on his blog. <laughs> or he thought he discovered it until people pointed out, no, we had a, it's called the Kai identity. It's been around actually for a couple of decades. Um, where, you know, if you want to look at, if you want to try to get a handle on our, you know, uh, on projections of carbon emissions, we can think of it as a product of factors. And the first term in, in that product is population. All other things being equal, more people using more energy coming from fossil fuels are going to create more carbon emissions. But there are, Several other terms. Um, uh, one of them has to do with, well, okay, how much energy are those people using? Um, people who use very little energy um, are contributing less uh, to, than those who are using a lot. And if that energy is from, coming from fossil fuels rather than renewables, well, then those people are using more energy as well. Uh, and so it's misleading to just focus on that first term, population. Because what's probably more important right now isn't the growth in population, but the industrialization of the rest of the world and the fact that uh, China uh, and, and, and India uh, uh, and increasingly and many other, you know, uh, previously uh, you know, uh, non-industrial uh, uh, countries are, are now industrializing and they're using more and more fossil fuels. And uh, if <laughs> and use more energy, and, and much of that energy is coming from fossil fuels. And if you have you know, uh, a billion people in, in China who start living an American lifestyle, um, that sort of carbon footprint, then our carbon emissions are going to, and then you have India, another billion people. Um, and so there is, has been an effort by some to sort of make it sound like population is, is the only factor. And that's not quite true. It's really the nature of that population and uh, the energy uh, usage and fossil fuel dependencies of the people uh, that you're talking about. Uh, now, it used to be uh, claimed, um, it was widespread just a few years ago, um, the claim that uh, global population will plateau by mid-century at 
under 9 billion people. We're at 7.5 and growing, but it's going to flat out now. It's a sigmoidal curve that, that flattens out. Um, and that was based on sort of demographic assumptions that d my understanding is don't seem to be holding up. Um, increasingly, it's looking like we could, we could reach 11 billion uh, people by the end of this century. And 11 billion people uh, burning 20, giga, uh, 20 uh, metric tons of uh, carbon uh, a year per person, um, that's when you start, that's when we're basically bringing back the Cretaceous. Um, we can do it. All that carbon was buried over 100 million years, and we're in the process of unburying it over 100 years. And there's enough carbon down there. We can get CO2 close to the, the levels that, uh, you know, that existed when dinosaurs roamed the planet. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll end with uh, this um, particular answer with a, a very important uh, a quote uh, about that. It, many of you have probably heard, um, you know, the... the Stone age didn't end for want of stones, right? And the fossil fuel age won't end for want of fossil fuels. It will end because we've recognized that something better has come along, and something better has come along. Renewable energy. I'm optimistic. That's the way the world is moving. I, I think the U.S. soon enough um, will fully get on board. Uh, we've had a little bit of a hiccup, a little bit of a, a, a wrinkle, um, but we'll get past that. Uh, you know, I, I think this was a wonderful opportunity for Anne to weigh in if you'd like to make a comment on Please. the climate population Please. interface. Uh, and if you could wait for the microphone, that'd be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Michael was looking at it through. I think Michael was looking at it through a prism of climate. And in fact, population and population growth are underlying several other problems that are existential Absolutely. problems that all interact with each Absolutely. other. I'm glad you point that out. I mean, yeah. in fact, I, I will often make that point that this is one axis in a multidimensional space. And some of the decisions that we might make to um, reduce carbon emissions and try to solve the climate problem, well, you know, renewable energy still has an environmental footprint. It doesn't, that of doesn't course. solve that problem. Yeah. Of course. But it's a very different one. And so far as we know now, much more benign. Thanks. Thanks so much. OK, next question. And there's a whole bunch of hands up. If you hold it high, then. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my, I have a tendency to give long-winded answers. I'm going to keep them shorter. Yeah. Okay, well, the, actually, the Danny in the back there got the microphone before you, so we'll, you'll be next. Hi there, Danny Cullen Ward. Uh, I'm on the Cap and Trade Oversight Committee here in California. And I want to ask you what is, frankly, going to be a pretty tough question. Um, here's a tough question. I, I think the biggest problem we have with tribalism right now is it's very easy to say somebody like Donald Trump isn't doing the right thing. I think it's very difficult to say when our friends aren't doing the right thing. And what I want to know from you is when politicians say they're doing something to fix the climate problem and they aren't, whether you consider that a form of climate denial. And to give you a great example of this, you don't have to comment on this example, our state climate strategy is to rely on the cap and trade program, but we're not implementing it. And as evidence of this, the president of the Western States Petroleum Association, the oil lobby on the West Coast, just praised Jerry Brown for his actions on this. And I just wonder if you can comment on this problem of the difficulty of actually solving this problem and the incentive to say you're doing it without actually doing it. Is that denial? Thanks. So um, I'm, I'm somewhat averse to using th that term um, in that context. Uh, I, I think it can be criticized. It's, it, you know, you're, you're not denying the science of climate change in that case, and you're not denying that we need to do something about it. In this case, you're just not following through on what's necessary to do something about it. And, and that's, that's uh, ripe for, for criticism. Uh, my own view, uh, I, I see Jerry Brown as somewhat of a hero in, in what he's done on climate, especially in an environment where we have not only a lack of leadership, but negative leadership um, uh, at the executive level and with a Congress that has been um, run by climate change uh, denying Republicans. Uh, California, the fifth largest economy in the world, um, still has leadership on this issue. Now, making good on those promises is critical. We have to hold our politicians accountable for making good on the promises. Um, but the same can be said, the same criticism one might make, say about uh, Jerry, uh, you could make about every country in the world right now, because very few of them are making good on their Paris commitments. And ironically, uh, the US is, is coming closer than most. Um, and, and why is that? And it's because of the leadership, 
the West Coast states, Jerry Brown having played a crucial role um, uh, in getting on board with efficiency. I mean, right, you know, we haven't accomplished all of the, the tasks that have been laid out, but uh, just the uh, efficiency measures um, uh, alone have helped California continue to grow its economy while, while decreasing uh, carbon emissions. Um, it's, uh, you know, because of what the West Coast states are doing, the New England states, uh, joined by New York and Maryland and New Jersey. It seems like there's a state missing. Uh, <laughs> large state yeah, that state seems you to live be in there, missing. yeah. Um, has a Democratic governor, but uh, anyways. Uh, but based on the progress we're seeing at the state level in these consortia of states like the REGI, the New England states, and the East Coast states, and the California consor uh, the West Coast consortium, and what big, our largest cities and a lot of our companies uh, are, are doing, uh, my understanding is we're, we're pretty much on track to meet our Paris obligations, whereas Europe um, is, is not, um, which is a little surprising for people to learn. Even in the era of Trump, we're doing quite well. Now here's the problem, that's not good enough. Meeting Paris obligations, if everybody meets their Paris obligations, that gets us not even halfway to the cuts that we need to avoid uh, you know, dangerous two degrees Celsius, 3.5 degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet. Um, so there has to be accountability. Um, uh, and, and, but that accountability really applies writ large. Um, and I'm just a little, I've, I'm struggling with, with criticizing Jerry Brown too much because when you take a step and you look at the larger picture, California has actually played a really important role. Um, they're doing more than just about anybody else. And I think that should be lauded while, you know, it's perfectly appropriate to continue to apply pressure because even, you know, we've got to do more than we're doing. And um, you've got an incoming governor who I actually had a long conversation with on the Bill Maher show and the party after the Bill Maher show. Uh, uh, Gavin Newsom was one of the guests the same week that I was on the show. Um, and uh, I told my wife afterwards, I had a little bit of a man crush <laughs> after. <laughs> um, impressive, impressive individual. You talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, man. He knows his stuff, um, and and I, I feel pretty comfortable um, in the direction that California is going to go under uh, his leadership. Just a, a little P.S. on that one. While we talk about Rex Tillerson being Secretary of State, don't forget that while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she sold fracking everywhere across the world. When you look at all the new gas plants all across the planet, Hillary made those happen. So it, it cuts across both ways. And Buckminster Fuller said, when something is broken, do not try to fix it. Create a new model that renders the old one obsolete. So how do we do that? And especially with the media, if you drive through the red states, Rush Limbaugh is on at every gas station, every diner, every cafe, and the left has no Rush Limbaugh. The closest we come is Rachel Maddow. How do we get the bombast and the dialogue to be controlled by the people who are right instead of the people on the right. <laughs> yeah, so um, you speak to a, a much larger problem um, that's a little bit above my pay grade. Um, and, and, and I think it, you also speak to the fundamental asymmetry in our politics. Um, you know, and, uh, and it's a, a real challenge uh, when you have one side that cares about facts and has principles that they um, try to uh, be true to, and another side that has a purely Machiavellian approach. Um, there's, there, there's an asymmetry, and we see that asymmetry in terms of the sorts of tactics that are deployed. Uh, dark money interests who have tried to fundamentally compromise our politics and our media. Um, you know, the Koch brothers, you may remember their effort to buy out the LA Times and, the, and that entire syndicate. Uh, if there's a fundamental problem um, that we need to repair, if we are to, you know, try to right the ship, um, we have to deal with that problem. The money in our politics, uh, you know, I, I wonder if the founding fathers truly envisioned um, a system where our media could be owned by private interests. Um, how could that possibly work out? Corporate ownership of our media, how could that possibly work out? How could it not lead us in the direction that we're going? It, 
um, and money in, and similarly money in politics. Uh, and uh, if I had an answer to that problem, <laughs> you know, then I, you know, uh, but that's, um, but that we, we, we can at least recognize what the problem is. Now there's some, like uh, Naomi Klein, who've articulated the case that, uh, that you cannot solve a problem like climate change or any problem involving environmental sustainability in the context of uh, a market system, uh, a, 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 um, a capitalist uh, system. Um, I'm not convinced that that's true. I hope it's not true um, because Overthrowing that is a far more monumental task than anything else that we've talked about. Uh, so I like to think that that isn't true, that we can solve environmental problems um, in a market framework as long as we have a level playing field. And that's what you know, environmental regulation, a price on carbon, I'll come back to Hillary Clinton. So I was a member of her um, a task force on energy and climate, uh, Hillary for America. Um, and, uh, and at one point, Bernie Sanders wanted me to, to uh, appear with him at a, at a rally in, in Penn State. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't because <laughs> I'm, I'm on Hillary's task force. But I, I gave him the name of, uh, of somebody uh, who, who could do that. Um, when I was asked to testify um, on behalf of Hillary for America at, the, um, at, at one of the uh, meetings that was held uh, the summer before um, that election, uh, uh, so there were several uh, meetings of the Democratic National Committee. Experts were brought in to advise the DNC um, in advance of uh, creating the, you know, finalizing the Democratic platform. And uh, Hillary uh, had not gone on record, had not committed to the idea that we need a price on carbon. Um, I went to testify on her behalf. Um, and the key point I made is that we need a price on carbon. Um, and I will not take credit for this development, but the Democratic uh, <coughs> platform that came out contained language that commits to a price on carbon. And it probably wouldn't have been there um, without a little bit of pressure. Um, even people who we think are on the right side and our friends sometimes need to be pressured to do the right thing. We all know that, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, any of us who raise children <laughs> know that. Um, and, uh, and that's the case here. Um, we can never, never assume that our, our friends will do the right thing without, because we know how much pressure there is on the other side. And without equal and opposite, you know, anybody who's studied uh, you know, basic physics knows, without equal and opposite pressure um, in the other direction, it's not going to happen. I want to do a quick follow-up, and then I think we'll probably have time for one or two more questions after that. Your uh, comment about an openness to including private sector components of the climate solution, points to the possibility of including some of the corporate entities that have been bad actors in the past, the oil and gas majors. How, how would you feel about uh, letting them into the solution space? I mean, that, that would be a dream come true, right? I mean, no, there's no ir more irresistible narrative than the, the, the villain <laughs> who, who becomes you know, Darth Vader, uh, maybe being a classic example of that sort of uh, almost uh, archetypal um, narrative. And, and so, I mean, to me, I, 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 a few years ago, um, I was actually, um, went out to Los Angeles to meet with uh, uh, movie directors, um, who, whose name will remain nameless, uh, um, who were, um, wanted to do a major Hollywood um, production about climate change. Um, and they were looking for uh, a, uh, a narrative that, uh, that would work, that would be sort of true to the science um, and, and yet effective. And it's hard to do. And, and the movies that have come out um, have, have taken shortcuts. So the day after tomorrow would be an obvious one. Yeah, if you speed up the, the time scale by a thousand, <laughs> you can make some really dramatic things happen. Although now, you know, it doesn't look as nearly as unrealistic as we thought it was, right? Um, but, um, and, and they asked me about my thoughts. Then uh, they were really about my thoughts on the science. They wanted, you know, to, and, and in, the, 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 the sort of uh, device that they were thinking about was sort of water wars between the East and the West that might emerge um, in the United States in the future. And, and we're starting to see that. I mean, you know, often, uh, 
you know, uh, it's interesting how life does imitate art, and, and we're sort of seeing that. Um, but but I, I offered an opinion, not just about the science, but about what I thought, you know, the, the a, a, a very effective underlying narrative would be like the fossil fuel, you know, um, you know, CEO who has this moment of, you know, has a catharsis and and decides to devote um, almost certainly his, <laughs> um, you know, in today's world, uh, be an old white ma man uh, um, to devote um, his efforts to to, to solving this problem. <laughs> they laughed at me. <laughs> Come on, really. They laughed at me. Um, so, you know, I. I, you know, that the sentimentalist in me, uh, it, it, but I, I do think you know that is what happened. For example, with uh, ozone depletion, where ultimately you had industry, they had to be prodded, and people who tell you otherwise are sugarcoating it. You sometimes hear the sort of um, the, uh, the, 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 the 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 story that um, you know an industry, you know, and the you know the private sector fully cooperated. Um, no, they they really had to be sort of uh, coerced to some extent, um, but ultimately. Uh, the industry recognized in this case that there were alternatives, uh, maybe a little more expensive, um, but uh, they were brought into the fold. And uh, ultimately, you know, DuPont and, and others um, played a crucial role in you know the development of the Montreal Protocol. And I think that has to be true. I think you need business on. You know, you, you need uh, you need them to be part of the conversation. You need them to be part of the. Um, you know, uh, be part of the solution. Ultimately, it doesn't mean all actors uh, will be you know, participate to an equal level. Um, sort of hard to envision an Exxon Mobil that uh, becomes uh, hawkish on uh, climate. Uh, but who knows? I, there was quite a bit of. Um, I'll, I'll say that if we extrapolate the trend, you had uh, Lee Raymond, you know, the previous uh, before uh, Rex Tillerson, who was an outright climate change denier. <laughs> And you have Rex Tillerson, who accepted the science, but downplayed you know, the urgency of getting off fossil fuels and upplayed geoengineering, because that's the way to solve this problem. Uh, keep on burning those fossil fuels, but throw all sorts of stuff in the atmosphere, dump all sorts of stuff into the ocean, and maybe we'll get lucky, and it'll solve the problem for us. Uh, and if it doesn't, we can always go to that planet B that we have. Uh, um, and uh, so you extrapolate the trend, who knows? Maybe the next Exxon uh, Mobil CEO will be a former head of an environmental organization. Yeah. <laughs> we, Why don't we take one last question? Thank you, for, excuse me. Thank you for being here, Michael. It's always a pleasure to hear you talk. Thanks. Uh, I'm afraid I'd agree with Naomi Klein. I don't see market capitalism as being a way to solve the climate problem because market capitalism is interested in money, not values, basically. But my, my question is, and my, my feeling is that we need basically a mobilization like we had in World War II, but with all the combatants or nations on the same side. We need a commitment to focus on this problem because it is absolutely an existential threat, not just to us, but all living things on the planet. And we have really run out of time to, to start doing something about it. We, we have to do more. And we don't have to say, well, we'll do more. We'll just push someone a little, push Jerry a little more. Maybe he'll, or then, and I know, I've met Gavin Newsom, and you're, he's as good as you say he is. Uh, and hopefully he'll do more than, than Jerry did. But I, I see this need for an absolute mobilization. And that's going to take a leadership from the United States, which we don't have now. So I, sent, uh, I was talking with Bill earlier, and he mentioned something that I'd already thought of. Politics right now is more important than the science. We have. Wait, what's the question? The, 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 <laughs> quest, the question is how do we how do we get to that place where people understand the real urgency of this, wherein that we have to deal with yeah, this. Yeah. Okay. Now. Thanks. That, that, that's true. Yeah. Got it. No. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I think we need to elect um, to Congress a charismatic. Um, young uh, woman politician um, to articulate the case for a Green New Deal. Um, uh, um, Maybe you could wait. No. <laughs> Alexandria, uh, Cortez. Yeah. Uh, 
so, you know, I, I actually think that that's an important development, that maybe that'll help change the conversation. You know, the other side is very effective at working the refs, and, and that's part of the reason for the inaction, is that the fossil fuel lobbyists have been so effective at moving the discourse uh, to the right, you need a counterbalancing uh, uh, you know, effort. And, and, and I think maybe we're going to have an interesting conversation. Um, now you've got Bernie Sanders in the Senate. Um, you've got uh, Alexandria um, Nun Cortez uh, Ocasio. Cantasio yeah, Ortez. Ocasio Ocasio Ortez. Yeah. Um, and so who knows? We may have a very different conversation um, in the next Congress. And obviously, you know, Congress can put forward legislation. It's not going to pass this Senate. Um, maybe in two years, we've got a different Senate. Uh, so I wouldn't give up yet. Um, the market, in the point that I never completed, was that we did actually prevail. Um, we, we've, you know, on, with acid rain and ozone depletion, we're not at 100%. But we've, well, but, you know, they involved uh, market mechanisms um, to internalize an environmental externality to level the playing field so that, you know, um, those products or companies that, you know, and that's what we need with, with climate as well. If we level the, the playing fields so that renewable energy can compete fairly against, you know, fossil fuel uh, energy that's harming the planet and, and harming us economically, in, in, indeed, as the latest National Climate Assessment Report, um, you know, lays out in stark terms. Um, we, we have seen success um, in the past. This is, as you say, a larger problem. This gets at the heart of our current uh, global energy economy, which is still driven primarily by fossil fuels. So it's a much bigger problem to tackle than acid rain, which had to do with coal-fired power plants in the Midwest, uh, or ozone depletion, which had to do with a few countries that were producing uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Um, in fact, uh, it turns out China is still producing more than we thought they were, and we recently there was some coverage of that recently. Um, so I don't want to give up yet on uh, the idea that we can solve it within a market framework. Um, I think we can engage uh, a bipartisan coalition of politicians on a market driven approach to solving this problem, whereas we're just not at the point in our politics where we're going to pass a Green New Deal through the current uh, Congress. Um, so I believe in you know, taking the baby steps that are available to us. Um, and so we're hitting the ground running when we, you know, we do go for larger fundamental structural changes. And, and they may be possible, but in the near term, they're not. And we have to make progress now because without substantial reductions in carbon emissions, as you alluded to, over the next decade or so, we essentially commit to, to catastrophic warming of the planet. We have to act now through those lever arms that are available to us now. And, and when we talk about progress on the climate challenge, it's nobody who is uh, advancing the game more uh, proactively and more effectively than Mike Mann. You're too kind. Join me too in kind. thanking him once again for a wonderful conversation.